Good morning and welcome to this SolarWinds webcast, our Secure by Design series. Today's topic, our plan for a safer SolarWinds and customer community. My name is Thomas LaRock. I'm your host today. I am a head geek here at SolarWinds. And with me, I have the privilege of being with my CEO, Sudhakar Ramakrishna. Sudhakar, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Absolutely. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for taking time to join us uh, today. Alex, whom I'll introduce in uh, just a minute, and I are looking forward to this discussion. Uh, we'd like to make it worthwhile for everyone to attend this forum and get a few key principles on what we are doing at SolarWinds and uh, sharing it with the broader industry to make us all safer and secure going forward. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, uh, my name is Sudhakar Ramakrishna. I joined the company exactly a month ago on January 4th. And uh, in my background, I have experience uh, working at uh, various companies in the areas of security, cloud, collaboration, mobile technologies, virtualization, and networking. So it spans the gamut, and it gives me a vantage point to look at deployments, enterprises, technologies as systems as opposed to point products uh, because as you will hopefully recognize as we go through the conversation today it is the confluence of all of these things that must be kept in mind as we think about enterprises that are secure by design uh, without further ado i'd like to pass on to my partner alex uh, and uh, give you a quick introduction to alex alex uh, thank you, Sudhakar. Uh, my name is Alex Stamos. I'm currently a partner with the Krebs Stamos Group. I'm also the director of the Stanford Inter Internet Observatory uh, and a lecturer in the computer science department at Stanford. Um, in my history, I've come from the computer security world for over 20 years, uh, and I was the chief information security officer at Yahoo and Facebook, uh, and I've spent the last couple of decades dealing with adversaries like this. Um, and so I'd like to give you a little bit of background on who we're dealing with and what kind of the situation is so you can understand then the recommendations we're going to have in this webcast for dealing with this level of adversary. And then you'll hear from Sudhakar about how SolarWinds is themselves specifically putting these recommendations into practice and, and dealing with the issues that have been found. Uh, next slide, please. So what we are talking about here since mid-December has been a discussion of a intrusion into at least dozens, probably hundreds of American businesses and government agencies by an organization called the SVR. The SVR is one of three intelligence agencies in Russia that are all active and have active uh, cyber intrusion capabilities. The agency we often hear about over the last couple of years has been the GRU. The GRU is the military intelligence uh, office. They, they report up through the uniformed officers in the Kremlin and the GRU has spent a lot of time and energy trying to undermine the NATO alliance, uh, as well as to do direct attacks against adversaries of theirs, such as Ukraine. Um, and so when we, we talk about the GRU, we often hear about uh, very destructive attacks, uh, such as pieces of malware, like NotPetya, um, that cause lots of damage, um, as well as intelligence gathering that is then used rather quickly as part of disinformation uh, and misinformation attacks. But there's turns out to be two other agencies in Russia that we have to be aware of, and those are the FSB and the SVR. Those two organizations, unlike the GRU, are the descendants of the KGB. So after the Soviet Union fell, the KGB was split up, and the domestic intelligence capabilities, effectively the secret police function of the KGB, was taken over by the FSB. The FSB does have very good hackers, um, but their activity is often focused on understanding what is going on within the borders of Russia, as well as within their near abroad, such as the former Soviet states like Ukraine. FSB also does a lot of hacking around the oil and gas industry. And then there's the SVR. The SVR is what used to be called the first directorate of the KGB. They are the foreign intelligence agency probably most equivalent to our CIA in the United States. Their job is to understand what's going on around the world, especially in the countries Russia considers adversaries, such as the United States. They're the ones that would have been running spies in the Cold War and living in the suburbs. If you've ever seen The Americans, one of my favorite TV shows, those would be people who now would work for the SVR. The SVR has incredibly good cyber operations teams. 
But the difference between them and, say, the GRU is that their goal is often the gathering of intelligence that is not used immediately um, and for which they do not use for destructive attacks. And that's what we've seen so far here is that one of the reasons that this campaign has able to last for well over a year is because they're incredibly subtle about the intrusion into all of these companies, but then also of covering their tracks afterwards and of gathering up information, exfiltrating it in a very careful way. Um, and so that's one of the interesting differences here. And one of the things we have to keep in mind as we deal with these adversaries is not all adversaries will do the kinds of things that GRU does that will make them pop under your radar to do this kind of work. Finding the SVR requires a very deep hunting capability. But overall, whether we're talking about the SVR or another actor, one thing you have to keep in mind is that offensive cyber has become the primary way that states both try to affect geopolitics uh, in a way that doesn't include kinetic action. So it has become the standard mechanism by which many, many countries uh, succeed in their efforts. Uh, you know, on the American example, the best example would be Stuxnet, which allowed the alliance of the United States and Israel to affect the Iranian nuclear program in a way that did not cause any cost of life um, and did not have uh, – destructive effects uh, on the civilian population of Iran. And so, you know, that kind of use of cyber has become extremely common. It is also absolutely um, the number one way that intelligence gathering happens these days. Um, and so one of kind of the lessons that I'd like uh, everybody to take away from discussion today is that the number of companies that now have to consider themselves at playing at this level, who have to understand who these intelligence agencies are, the People's Liberation Army and the Ministry of State Security uh, in, in the People's Republic of China, the Lazarus Group in the, uh, North Korea, um, APT-31 in Vietnam, the number of companies that need to play against this level of adversary has massively grown. 20 years ago, the only companies that had to think about this kind of capability where you have a dedicated team sitting in a government office who have months and months, perhaps even years to break into single targets would have been members of the defense industrial base. And then you had to add to that uh, in the, the mid 2000s, you had the large banks, oil and gas industry. Famously in 2009, Silicon Valley was brought into this through the Aurora attacks where Sil here in Silicon Valley, we started to understand that we were playing at this level um, with the People's Liberation Army. But in 2020, 2021, it turns out that almost every Fortune 500 company and anybody who's a vendor to the Fortune 500 is now a legitimate target of attack for this level of attacker. And so to protect against that, you have to really change the way you do security. If you expect that somebody every day is going to come in, get their coffee, and they're going to spend the entire day trying to think about how to break into your company, um, and they're going to do that for months and months, to defend against that level of attacker, you have to act differently. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Thanks for that wonderful background, Alex. Uh, it's really, it's like you said, there's there's a lot to unpack as to what's really happening. So uh, a quick overview of the agenda today. Uh, we've already taken care of the welcomes and what our focus is for today. We're going to spend some time talking about our principles to secure the enterprise. We'll uh, we will then discuss our plan for the safer solar winds and customer community. We'll bring it to a close. We've uh, prompted for some Q and A. Uh, I have a list of questions to ask both Sudakar and Alex at the end, and of course the thank you. So Sudakar, I want to start with you a little bit. I want you just tell me why is this you know so important to you? Why are we here today? Uh, Tom, that is um, a very pertinent question as uh, Alex gave in his introduction. This is something that I feel very strongly about. Uh, in some ways, I have a very unique vantage point because I came into the company just about a month ago and had the opportunity to not only assess what we have, but also focus on what we need to do going forward, not just from a solar wind standpoint, but what can we contribute to the broader community. But before we think about the changes, it's important to understand what's happening in our landscape. And some of these trends have been going on for quite some time, except that with situations like COVID, these trends have accelerated. Most of us, for instance, work from home and therefore devices and peripherals that we use are completely fragmented and unique to the individual as well. That puts an additional stress on IT organizations and IT systems in terms of provisioning, in terms of supporting 
the needs of the users in their environments. So that's an element of hybrid IT. On the other side, if you think about infrastructure applications, they're be being distributed as well. Some for economic reasons and many for need-based reasons. So in that world, what happens is the job of IT, the job of securing enterprises becomes exponentially more complex. That requires a certain and different approach to how you secure your enterprise, because what you cannot do is to simply clamp everything down. And even if you try to clamp everything down, when you are being fought by adversaries who have many more resources, you simply cannot um, maintain your defenses. Consequently also, what happens either due to organizational challenges or organizational boundaries, the way things are set up, cloud configurations, Active Directory configurations, application permissions tend to be very fragmented. So oftentimes those themselves increase the threat surface, as we like to call it, in enterprises, and they have to be managed and understood as well. And as we just heard, threat actors are becoming increasingly sophisticated and are much more well-resourced. So as I assess the common industry practices, including at Solovins, what we have continued to uh, believe uh, that will be highlighted here is that many of the vendor breaches are happening because of different threat vectors, right? And it is very difficult for one single enterprise using traditional practices of be it IT management, software development, uh, and deployment to be able to thwart all of these uh, challenges. And so this presents a very unique opportunity to learn, to improve, to iterate and share for the safety and security of all environments. So the pledge we have taken at SolarWinds is how do we create a enterprise that is secure by design in every sense of the word? And there are three elements of that which you will see. First and foremost, I like to always start with people because security research indicates that while there are a lot of challenges, technologies, techniques presented to support the security needs of enterprises. Many security challenges emanate because of either things like configuration problems or human errors, uh, clicking on a phishing attack email, for instance. So there's a very strong element in security and securing of people in terms of the, our behaviors, in terms of the techniques that we implement and the principles that we adopt. Uh, two is obviously the infrastructure that we rely on, not just premises based, but broadly speaking, hybrid IT and hybrid infrastructure. It could be virtual engines, it could be cloud instances, it could be multi-cloud instances, and then not to mention applications and people's identities. And as a software developer and as a software company, re-looking at build systems, our software development life cycles, which I'm now dubbing them as secure development life cycles, are all elements of what we call secure by design. These are things that I've had the experience of implementing in other companies, but there is really an opportunity to set a completely new and better standard at Solovitz. But in doing so, we felt it is not sufficient to simply use the principles practices that we are familiar with or we project them to be and instead make it a community effort. Part of making this a community effort was why I asked Chris Krebs and Alex to see if they can come and work with us to accelerate this journey and broaden the scope of this and ensure that not only is SolarWinds safe, but the broader security industry, the broader community uh, is safe as well. So what I'll do next is turn it over to Alex to walk through a few basic principles along these three pillars. And I'll also try to comment on what we have already done here at SolarWinds or what we plan to do on a go forward basis. So Alex. Okay, great. So what I'm gonna do is talk about some of the basic things you should keep in mind uh, based upon what we know from uh, the forensic work that has happened inside of SolarWinds, there's two great companies doing that. CrowdStrike and KPMG have done fantastic work on the incident response here. Um, and so I'm basing this upon their fantastic output and I thank them for it. Um, 
and uh, what we know of the open reporting of the intrusions into other companies as part of this. So this will be changing. Also, uh, if you want the details, we'll be publishing a white paper. Probably not appropriate for me to get to exact registry keys and the like today. Uh, but we'll talk about like the overall principles people should keep in mind if you're trying to defend against this kind of attack. The first is that you know, we find ourselves in an interesting place where many large enterprises have are kind of halfway moved in the cloud when it comes to an identity management perspective. Uh, one of the great security uh, improvements over the last couple of years has been people giving up their on-premise Active Directory and Exchange servers, and instead moving to Azure Active Directory and Office 365. I think for the most part, this is a very positive thing. But what we see right now is that lots of companies are kind of halfway moved. They have an Azure Active Directory environment, but it's running in a hybrid mode. And it is connected up possibly to multiple domains that are hosted on on-prem domain servers. And then in some cases you have two-way trust here. And so unfortunately this halfway move means that you are often exposed to vulnerabilities both against the cloud instance of Azure Active Directory, as well as kind of the traditional escalation paths uh, and vulnerabilities that exist in domain servers that are still held. And so one of the things that needs to be, uh, companies should think about here is really accelerating their transition to cloud identity where their cloud identity provider, which is often Azure Active Directory, but it can also be the Octas and one logins and the like, that that cloud identity provider is the one source of truth. And to think about the different kinds of escalation paths that still exist and whether or not they allow escalation on-prem that becomes escalation in the cloud. This was a problem in the attack that we've seen against SolarWinds was the ability of the attackers to do things locally that then allowed them to go back and create persistence in the cloud. And so completing that transition and thinking very carefully about which attack surfaces you're providing and reducing it to only the on-prem or cloud attack surface is one thing people should do. Next. It's really important to audit uh, both your on-prem systems, but also your cloud providers, and to focus on the web of trust that exists between your systems and these providers. SolarWinds obviously um, is, is doing everything it can to secure its own systems, and but it will also be working with uh, its customers so that they can understand the security parameters around their on-premise software uh, and how they can properly secure it. Uh, but the other things that are coming out is that there's a bunch of different trust mechanisms that people didn't really understand. We have this golden ticket issue, um, as well as a number of situations where cloud service providers were used to enter into enterprises because those cloud service providers needed very high privileges for some initial work. And then those privileges were not removed when that work was completed. And so having a, a very good understanding of who you were relying upon and which of your service providers have security uh, have security uh, privileges inside of your network, and then making sure to deprovision them as soon as possible is a critical thing that you've got to do. Next thing to consider is kind of the basics around authentication for all of your users, and then really aggressive use of modern authentication and authorization technologies for your administrators. So this obviously means multi-factor authentication rolled out for all of your users. Um, this entire campaign was caught apparently because of a the use of multi, uh, factor authentication within another company that they got an alert that then allowed them to do an analysis. Having that kind of MFA not only prevents one uh, prevents exploitation and the escalation of privilege into higher level accounts, but it also creates another stream of data that you can use to monitor and alert on and to respond quickly. Um, having then for all of your users risk-based authentication, um, which is something you can get sometimes from these identity providers built in, sometimes with third parties is really critical. And then for your at administrators, conditional access and just-in-time permission management is a critical thing. You do not need to have dozens and dozens of people with continuous capability to have effectively global administrator access to your Azure AD tenant. You should have one or two break glass accounts that are never used. And when they are used, it sets off alarms across the building. But then the admin accounts, and again, these should be dedicated admin accounts for administrators. So not the accounts they're using to browse the web or to use email. They should have you know, probably their name dash admin accounts um, in Azure Active Directory, as well as on-prem. Those need to be set with very strong MFA, preferably to hardware token-based MFA, and then should be have the ability to request permissions and have those permissions granted via a two-person system, um, just in time for them to do their work. And then those, those permissions need to be deprovisioned very quickly after their work is completed. Um, 
this again is something we see the SVR and adversaries at that level are very, very good at getting into these accounts. And then once they have access to those accounts, if you're not doing this kind of just-in-time provisioning, if you're not doing conditional access, then they have the run of the place. Um, and so you want to make that extremely difficult that there's lots and lots of opportunities to detect that the adversary is in your network because they are constantly running up against a conditional access policy or having to ask people to escalate their privileges on their behalf. Alex, good, uh, good points all. So as we've looked at um, from a Solovins uh, environmental standpoint, the types of things that we've been thinking about is not just the audit aspect of it, which is very crucial to understand what are the policy islands where might configuration um, gaps and inconsistencies arrive, arise. And to Alex's point, how do we consolidate them? The principal focus that we've had is to ensure that we build a complete enterprise where privileges are granted on a least privileged access basis. In other words, flipping some of the old paradigms on their head and not having too many administrative accounts, and then doing the notion of just-in-time permissions, both in terms of the infrastructure as well as the build systems, which you will hear about shortly. What this really does is reduce the attack surface that I was talking about in the context of setting the stage for this discussion, as well as eliminates or reduces the time potential for a threat actor to inject anything malicious into our systems. And to the degree that they're able to do anything, that it actually compresses the amount of time that they can actually cause damage. So Alex, those are some of the changes that, um, as you know, we've been already implementing at Sullivan. So why don't we get to the next principle uh, and then uh, continue the conversation. So now talking about software development, I think clearly this incident has greatly raised awareness of the supply chain security issue with both on-prem and cloud products. Now this issue is not new, right? There have been a number of cases of the supply chain being attacked to uh, access different enterprises. Probably the, the most interesting nation state example is the attacks against the RSA secure ID tokens, which were then used for intrusions against the defense industrial base. Um, but certainly the scope and scale and success of this specific attack makes it stand out. And the other thing that stands out about this attack is the incredible subtlety of the mechanisms by which the SVR was able to insert themselves into SolarWinds' build chain. This was not uh, a implant that was inserted into the source code and then made its way through the build environment. This was the mechanism here was the insert of a custom piece of malware that was written specifically for this purpose that was inserted into a build system that watched the build steps happen and then replaced one file for on the order of something like 100 milliseconds allowed that file to get compiled and then deleted it and cleaned up its tracks with that implant now making its way down through the process. Defending against that level of supply chain attack, where you're not just inserting code on the front end or you're not replacing uh, DLLs or EXEs on the back end, but you're inserting in the middle of a very complex build process requires building software in a very different way. Um, and so this is something that we're making recommendations inside of SolarWinds, but is clearly going to become a need for all enterprise software makers, because the truth is, is in my experience working with hundreds of companies on security issues, I don't think I have seen a build process that is perfectly designed against this kind of level of adversary. And so some of the things that we're gonna have to think about. First, your build systems for at least your release software are going to have to be separate, isolated, administratively separated, um, and preferably uh, created just in time with very little opportunity for persistence. So one of the things that happened here was the attack on SolarWinds's IT infrastructure allowed the attackers then to get into their build systems. But the truth is, is in the vast majority of enterprises, the people who are doing administrative IT are separate from often a DevOps team or a engineering success team who is maintaining the build pipeline and running the build pipeline. Those are different groups and don't necessarily have to have uh, access to each other's systems. And so building your a build pipeline that is completely administrative separated, that's on a completely different source of truth for authentication and authorization, um, and that is only accessible to a very small number of trusted people is a pretty critical thing. Um, and the best way to do this is by 
building preferably a cloud-based system where you are creating containers or instances just in time based upon configurations that are visible to everybody. Those configurations are checked in to something like a GitHub or another kind of repository that everybody has access to, that you have tightly controlled access to both the repository and then to the build config systems, and then preferably on systems that are, are born just for building uh, the uh, production release and then are torn down and never seen again by the time the release uh, is signed and pushed out. This is quite difficult. And it's difficult because build systems are generally not built kind of uh, thoughtfully, honestly. Build environments in complex companies, both for internal software and for ship software, grow organically as the product grows. And so it does mean you have to be very deliberate about thinking about how you do builds because having a build system where individual engineers cannot tweak tiny little things to make it work can be difficult. That being said, once you do it correctly, it will greatly increase your the efficiency of your software development process because you will not have those weird little moments at which making the, you know, shipping a patch requires somebody to go in and to change one config in a way that does not persist uh, later and is not learned from later. The next thing you should think about is recording forensic artifacts throughout your build. This is not a standard thing that people generally do. Usually uh, you have these build pipelines. They're on a systems that are doing builds continuously. They're doing CI CD continuously. And so as a result, you end up churning all the forensic artifacts on these systems. You're writing down temporary files, deleting them, creating log entries very quickly. And those log entries are not tied usually to the cryptographic identity of individual files. And so building a build process where you collect forensic artifacts all the way, meaning something like a SHA-256 of the source code file, of the intermediate build steps, of the temporary files created, and then of the output files, and then recording that in something like a SIM or a one-way log aggregator is going to be a critical thing because that would allow you to go back. And if there's a situation where you want to check this, you have the forensic artifacts in a way that you that is secure against um, attackers cleaning up their tracks, where you can try to find the place where things deviated. There have been some interesting research projects where people have worked on kind of cryptographically signing all of this stuff. I think those are really interesting things to work, but as of right now, if you're trying to do this, pretty much any build system that allows you to do arbitrary scripts will allow you to call in and to collect your own cryptographic artifacts, um, either by signing or by generating hashes and pushing it into a one-way logging system. Um, and then finally, in the build process, um, you need to really focus on the accountability for each piece of the ship code. And so as part of your security team's exercise in this area, a really smart thing to do is to you know, have them pick out a specific function in a DLL, a specific function in a, a shipped executable, and then to work backwards who was responsible for writing this code and does the code that was written actually match up the object code that we are shipping out to our, that we signed and shipped out to our customers. Turns out that that is not that easy, right? And there's a bunch of different security uh, skills that are required to go backwards along that pipeline and to figure out where did the code come from. And so that's an exercise I recommend any enterprise software maker do with their security team is ask their security team, if this function right here turns out to be malicious, what capability do you have to figure out what was there? And when you do that exercise, you will figure out, hmm, these are the things we need to change in our build process for visibility. And these are the vulnerabilities we discovered when we went through this process where we think that if somebody has, was able to get a global admin or a domain admin or the equivalent in the Unix system, if somebody was able to get administrative privileges, they would be able to insert something in this place that would be extremely difficult for us to figure out either in real time or through uh, uh, post hoc uh, investigations. Um, and then uh, when you talk about security overall, when you do a secure development lifecycle and you integrate security, um, you need to do it early in the process. And everybody's a big fan of security training, but I think one of the things you really need to think about is training your engineers on the positive things they need to do for security, not just about vulnerabilities. There's way too much focus when we talk about security training for engineers of just giving them the laundry list of Here's what SQL injection is. This is what cross-site scripting is. This is what a privilege escalation is. This is what buffer overflow is. This is what a format string bug is. That's great for them to understand those things. But what's more useful is to build a software development lifecycle where there are well-supported, well-audited functions for the most dangerous things that happen in the applications you build. Authentication, input validation, output escaping, and the like. And that those functions are then required. Your training focuses not just on the vulnerabilities, but in the mechanisms, the the 
uh, engineers can use to reduce the attack surface and to make sure that those vulnerabilities are never created in the first place um, and to reduce the ability of them to make mistakes. Um, and so that's, I think, part of the SDLC process that needs to change a little bit here is less focus on individual vulnerabilities, more focus on eliminating attack entire classes of vulnerability through the appropriate use of libraries and the, the reduction of attack surface. So Alex, um, it is a philosophy of a design-based focus versus a test-based focus after the fact. Because uh, if you take a test-based focus after the fact, that is uh, a situation where it's almost impossible to be able to build that into the fabric and create an interlocking set of systems that reduce uh, the challenges that um, we and others have faced. So as it relates to the build environments, some of the things that uh, are going on to improve the integrity and, as I like to say, the non-repudiation of the code that we deliver is not just the binary compatibility in one way, but we also are decompiling stuff to make sure that it traces back to the source code. That is one aspect of it. Two is going back to the reduction of the threat surface and providing just-in-time permissions, ensuring that the least privileged access model applies into our source code as well as our build systems uh, themselves. And then the other process that we are taking, which I think is above and beyond what is normal, is having parallel build and parallel pipeline systems and having check checksums and hashing mechanisms across each one of those and ensuring the integrity across multiple environments. The implication of that is that even if one environment is compromised, it, the threat actor would have to move laterally across multiple environments to ensure that they are doing exactly the same things in exactly the same sequence. The probability of that is highly unlikely. And so that is the next level of um, security and safety that we are injecting into our supply chain. And to your previous point, highlighting forensics or recording forensics at each one of the steps in the software development life cycle such that we can go back and learn and iterate um, going back all the way to how we set the stage uh, for, this, uh, for this discussion. Uh, there's obviously one other critical set of principles that we need to adopt. So why don't you go into that next? Great, thank you. Um, and so the last one is thinking about the people and the processes you have in place to prevent against this kind of intrusion. Modern defense is best thought of, of being uh, a threat focused of thinking about what are the capabilities my adversaries have and what can I do to protect against every step of them. And the, the difficult truth that everybody has to accept is that if you have an organization of any complexity, more than a couple of dozen employees, um, and you have on-prem and cloud software, and you have all of the normal kinds of complexity that exists in a modern enterprise, and you go up against an adversary like this, you will not be able to stop them from initially getting into your network. It is effectively impossible. Remember, we're talking about adversaries that have full-time research teams, full-time R&D teams, building brand new malware uh, kits and C2 systems, and who have months and months to get into your enterprise. Stopping the initial intrusion and the initial execution of malicious code in your environment is impossible. That doesn't mean we don't wanna to try to make it hard but you can't build all of your defenses with the expectation of just keeping the attackers out. What you have to do is you have to expand the breach mentally of what are the steps my adversary would want to take to successfully have a campaign against my company, whether that's to input some, put something malicious into my products that I ship, whether it's to steal data from my company, whether it's to break my systems and disrupt my operations on behalf of a, a competitor of mine. You have to think about all of those different steps and then put protections in at each of those steps. And the framework I like to use for this is the MITRE attack framework, the enterprise compromise framework. The MITRE team has done a really good job of documenting the different kinds of steps different adversaries take along this. Um, and so we have to shift right a lot of our protections. So one of the things you got to do is you have to, when you go through and you think through all the steps in the kill chain, uh, in the MITRE attack framework, think about for each one of those steps, what are we monitoring? What kinds of logs are we collecting? What kinds of alerts are being generated? And 
what is our response capability for each of those steps? Um, and so you can do this both just mentally by sitting down and thinking through it with your team. The other thing you can do is do exercises where you ex express all this. But the, the goal is for each of those steps to not expect that you can make it impossible, but to raise the difficulty of the step happening. And then to also raise the capability to monitor and detect. Um, and then if you're going to do that, you have to have the ability to respond. One of the great ways to try to figure this out is to do red team and tabletop exercises. So when you're doing a red team, you're usually doing an actual technical intrusion where people are simulating a specific attacker skill set and you're seeing what kinds of information was gathered along. And so I, I, I'm a big fan of these kinds of red teams. Um, and when you do the red team, it's, it's important that the blue team does not know it's an exercise, right? So it's a great idea to do this in a way where only a couple of executives in the company know that it's exercise. Everybody else has to act as if it's a real intrusion. And then when you're all done, when you've called it, you've said, okay, that was an exercise, great work, everybody. And you do the, the post-action review that you very carefully step through every documented step of what the red team did. And a good red team is spending half their time writing notes. They're not just hacking and at weigh your stuff, but they're keeping notes on every single step they took and then work with the red team to understand, okay, great. At this step, you were local admin on this machine and then you became a domain admin on the domain controller. Let's talk about the three or four intermediate steps for that privilege escalation. And then you look at those intermediate steps and you're like, could we have logged that? Could we have loaded on that? Could we have responded to it? And for each of those steps, Take notes for yourself of what could we have done better and then make that part of your security planning for the next six months. Um, and then you can also do tabletop exercises with executives to make sure that your response to that technical work would have been appropriate. Um, and then what you really need to focus on is having an internal team that can handle most, the vast majority of this kind of activity. Um, there are situations in which you can have like a managed ser security service provider do some of this work. But the truth is, is against this level of adversary, you need to have a pretty tight response time that within 12 to 24 hours on one of these alerts, you want to have an analyst who is diving in and who is arms deep in the evidence that you have preferably collected into one central location and that is available to all your analysts on demand. Um, and so the way I usually think about this is you want to build an internal team that can handle kind of 98% of your activity that the vast, vast majority of the, the alerts you get of the different situations you face can be handled internally end to end without calling on external folks. Um, but then for the top 2% when it's like, oh man, this this is gone. This looks real, right? And we're going to have to do something here that we normally don't do. Maybe we're going to have to reverse engineer a Windows kernel implant. Maybe we're going to have to do some really deep network forensics because it looks like this is, might be a C2 um, a mechanism, command and control mechanism that's very, very subtle. Then you already have relationships with trusted third parties that you can bring in reasonably quickly. So you're not caught in a multi-day kind of contract negotiation situation uh, or waiting for somebody to get back to you on a Monday, uh, a salesperson, so that you can finish your response. Um, and so thinking about by doing the red team exercise and the tabletop exercises, you will start to figure out what you want to handle in-house and what you think is appropriate to handle um, outside. Um, and then that will help you figure out what kinds of parameters you have for what who those outside vendors are. Alex, um, in the in the one month or so that I've been here, I've been talking to a number of customers and partners um, throughout the world, uh, and including the authorities, uh, both in terms of what we have learned, as well as uh, what we are doing. So I'm highlighting some of those things here, uh, in terms of the concept of red team and concept of expanding our monitoring capabilities uh, across the entire event chain. At the same time, we have a very large and diverse customer base. So when we think about forming red teams and um, having parallel streams, et cetera, they may apply to one set of customers, but a large set of customers also are looking to us to ensure that we provide guidelines, both in case of hardening guidelines uh, across their environments, as well as be able to automate a lot of these things. So what we are doing is first doing it at solar events and then leveraging that experience to ensure that our hardening guides are simple and yet complete to provide customers the ability to not only protect themselves north south, so to speak, but also east west. So we may have um, guidelines across the environment, for instance, of how to set up your firewall rules in cases where you want to turn on internet access on an Orion software platform, for instance. 
those types of capabilities should further reduce the ability for a threat actor to do damage in a customer's environment, but also provide you the insights required for monitoring whether you have large teams to be able to do this or not. I consider that to be an obligation that Solovins has in the context of us delivering not only powerful and affordable solutions that we have known to deliver over the years, but also powerful, affordable, and secure solutions. And as a result of that, not only do we implement the principles that we're talking about here today, uh, but also continue to build on it uh, going forward. Across the board, we are looking at tools, techniques, procedures, which will translate into our product and automate it as best as we can, provide true support in a hybrid IT world through our solutions, but also through our learnings and practices. But most importantly, I want to thank our customers, partners, and community members who are on this call because over the years, and while I have not been here uh, for a long time, I have learned the history of how we have grown with and through the community of learning from you, but also sharing with you. And one of the things that I um, am actively trying to do at SolarWinds and across the industry is to raise the level of collaboration in terms of these types of best practices, such that together we can make faster progress and defend ourselves better and deliver better experiences to IT professionals and end users. So in that regard, you can expect that we will continue to be transparent. And to the degree that you need help with us talking to either you or I've seen some of the chat messages about your um, board and others, both in terms of our learnings, as well as what we are doing to progress further, uh, we are at your service. So with that, um, I'd like to um, pass it back to you um, to get some Q&A uh, and listen to the audience's feedback. Absolutely. Uh, wonderful presentation to both of you today is uh, great information for our customers and for the attendees. I think this is exactly what they needed to hear from us today. And um, Alex, your, your depth of experience, I think, is just unmatched. But I also want to make sure we call out uh, Sudhakar, your efforts. Uh, I can't even imagine what it was like to step in as a new CEO and having this happen at the same time. I don't even want to go into my kitchen when it's dirty and think about all the stuff I have to do. So thank you for your efforts and leading us for these past eight weeks uh, and in bringing on Alex and, and Chris, just wonderful. So thank you. So let's get to some questions. Uh, the first question we have, what degree of persistence, if any, do the threat actors still have in solar winds or other affected parties? I think, Sue Docker, that might be one for you. So based on the evidence that we have seen in the investigation that we have conducted to date and the changes and the improvements that we have made, we do not see uh, the threat actor in our environment. Uh, we do not believe they exist. But as you all know, this is an ongoing process. This is not a point in time uh, type process, but we have done everything we are aware of uh, to ensure that our environment is safe and uh, secure. Great. Uh, so next one, what is SolarWinds plan for checking code that is put into their application? So we, we covered this through the discussion uh, today. There's a number of initiatives that we have already implemented. One of the key things that I highlighted was the practice of having multiple build pipelines and multiple environments with just-in-time access with a heavy amount of, call it, forward and reverse checking of source to binary, binary to, um, to source. What that does really is greatly reduce the possibility of compromise, consistent compromise across multiple environments, which is really what we are trying to eliminate by having different administrative domains and controls in different sets of the build pipeline. Those things are in process, which we believe are far above and beyond what is a industry norm in terms of software development life cycle, because it is typical that you'll have one pipeline, set of engineers working on that, 
you create a binary, sign it with a certific certificate, and that's your mark of integrity and non-repudiation because you signed it with your certificate. Obviously, in the types of sophisticated supply chain attacks that we are seeing, simply signing it with a certificate is not um, enough. And as you have seen in other instances of other vendors reporting, their certificates are also getting stolen. And I think Alex mentioned the RSA example in one instance. So the reason why we are doing it in, in multiple discrete with different permissions is to significantly eliminate for the same attack to have happened in multiple environments to the same files. And so that is a unique thing that we are doing, which we plan to again publish as a white paper for the broader software industry to potentially follow to increase not just the integrity of what we build, what we build and deliver, but as I've been trying to emphasize the notion of non-repudiation uh, to ensure that it is true and complete. Wonderful. Uh, next question. Can you put together a comprehensive step-by-step -step outline for setting up hardened security recommendations, not just the end result, but the actual steps needed? I, I think we've kind of answered that already, but maybe I'll, elaborate again. I'll touch on that, um, Tom, because uh, I think this is a very important thing and that has come up in pretty much all my customer conversations over the last month or so. So just for a context, we do have config and hardening guides today in uh, as part of our standard offerings. What we are in the, in the plans of doing now next is to take those and not just make it product specific, but make it more environmentally specific. So as we think about those guides, we should think about a customer in the context of the complete deployment as opposed to simply let's call it Orion or any one of our Solovins products. That is the next evolution that you will see. In addition to that, as it relates to our own products, to focus on some of the principles that we discussed in terms of least privileged access, do we need complete admin access in every instance? And how can we enable a customer to escalate the access as needed versus doing it by default? Those are some of the things that we harden by default, so to speak, as well as provide guidelines to harden their own environments. That's wonderful. Uh, next question. How are you reviewing and prioritizing creating product security patches for publicly or internally known or reported security vulnerabilities? Uh, as I first um, highlighted in my very first blog on January 7th, um, in the context of Secure by Design, one of our goals was to not just drive transparency, but also leverage outside parties, ethical hacking communities, such that we are able to identify as many issues as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Clearly what we have done from a product prioritization, engineering prioritization standpoint, is to look at some of these challenges first and ensure that we provide a heightened level of focus from our release planning standpoint, as well as prioritization standpoint. That will be an ongoing effort um, and once we kind of get through the initial push, let's say, on these principles that we have created, then we build a more regular cadence, similar to, let's say, Microsoft having like a patch Tuesday. Every Tuesday, you can expect a bunch of patches uh, related to, to security. So we'll build a cadence along those lines, which is the reason why I even call the software development lifecycle, which is SDLC, and more focus it on secure development life cycles. Okay. Uh, next is, when should we expect a stable version of SolarWinds that does not need further updates and security patches against Sunburst and Supernova? Um, that's a good question. Uh, what I can say here, and Alex, you may have a point of view here as well, is the code that is out there, which we have, um, tested, recertified, is free of Sunburst uh, already. Supernova, as you know, is unrelated to Solovin's code itself. It's a separate um, third-party uh, issue. 
However, what I can say is that this is going to be an ongoing process. We are going to learn, uh, just like any other software vendor out there, I mentioned Patch Tuesdays just in my response to the previous question. Mm -hmm. We will keep learning, we'll keep iterating, and we'll keep being transparent. I think those are some of the things that uh, we are committed to doing as part of the secure development lifecycle practice at SolarWinds. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is not like a one and done type thing. This is part of our fabric going forward. And we expect and hope that it is the part of the fabric of the industry going forward. Yeah, if, if I may add, um, what you want to see here is you want to see a regular set of updates that continuously improve the software. Um, uh, like Sue Doctor said, the, the specific issue here has been closed with the, the latest Orion release. Um, so it is important for customers to get up on the latest version of the Orion platform. And SolarWinds is working out deals with folks to uh, to try to get them up there, even if they're out of maintenance and such. So you can talk to your customer rep at SolarWinds about that. Um, but the truth is, is like software is made by humans and is therefore fallible. Uh, and, and any reasonably complex software product, even not that complex. We're, within the last couple of weeks, we just had a bug in Sudo, like one of the most basic command line apps upon which security rests on all Unix systems has had a vulnerability in it for a very long period of time. Um, like this is just the, the reality of software. And so what you wanna see is for companies to have a strong vulnerability disclosure program, to have a good relationship with the security research community, to intake vulnerabilities quickly, to move them through the process quickly, and then to patch them as reasonably quickly as possible, but on a regular basis, especially when you're talking about enterprise software. Um, and so those are all things that we're gonna be working on with SolarWinds. But the idea that like there's just going to be a version of, of any SolarWinds product that you'll never have to patch again is just not true, just as that's not true for anything that other companies that have thousands of security engineers and billions of dollars to spend on security is not true for them. The, the last Microsoft Patch Tuesday had hundreds of patches for interesting security bugs, and that's what you want to see. That is what you see out of responsible companies. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, that's the end of the Q&A. We're going to wrap up now. Uh, again, I want to thank you both for your time today, Alex and Sudakar. Just wonderful information for our customers. There's some key resources here. Um, and again, I just want to thank you all for your time today. Thank you for attending uh, and this SolarWinds webcast series, Secure by Design. Thank you. Thank you all.